Let's start with this one. Former President Donald Trump allegedly praised Adolf Hitler, saying the Nazi leader had, quote, done some good things. According to a new book, The Return of Great Powers by CNN's Jim Shudo, retired General John Kelly, who of course served as White House Chief of Staff in the Trump administration, recounted several conversations where Trump spoke favorably about Hitler. From the book, quote, he said, well, but Hitler did some good things, Kelly said of one conversation with Trump. I said, well, what? And he said, well, Hitler rebuilt the economy. But what did he do with that rebuilt economy? He turned it against his own people and against the world. And I said, sir, you can never say anything good about the guy. Nothing. End quote. Trump also admired Nazi officers' loyalty to Hitler, according to Kelly. Mm. The book quotes... He would ask about the loyalty issues and about how, when I pointed out to him, the German generals as a group were not loyal to him and, in fact, tried to ass assassinate him a few times, and he did not know that, Kelly said. In a statement, Trump's spokesperson dismissed Kelly's comments and said he is suffering from a severe case of Trump derangement syndrome. On the heels of this report, it's worth recalling the, according to a 1990 investigation by Vanity Fair, Trump's late wife, Ivana Trump, quote, told her lawyer, Michael Kennedy, that from time to time her husband reads a book of Hitler's collected speeches, My New Order, which he keeps in a cabinet by his bed. Ugh. So, uh, again, the source material here, Joe, is General Kelly, uh, right. obviously a highly decorated general who served at the right hand of Donald Trump for many years. So a guy with credibility who's recalled other conversations where Donald Trump has called fallen soldiers suckers and losers and now revealing that he had a lot of fondness for Adolf Hitler. Yeah, and, and Trump derangement syndrome, sorry, uh, whatever idiot said that. We're talking about a man who dedicated his entire life to serving the United States military uh, at war, in peace. Uh, Gene Robinson decided uh, to go in and work with Donald Trump, even though uh, he had some concerns. He did it for his country. He ended up being Donald Trump's longest running chief of staff. This is not a guy with Trump derangement syndrome. This is a man who is deeply concerned about Donald Trump calling dead Americans uh, war heroes suckers when Donald Trump is sitting next to a man there whose own son sacrificed his mm. life for his country in yeah. Afghanistan. So, so no Trump derangement syndrome here. The problem is, and we see it over and over again, and let's just keep going back to that famous saying, when somebody tells you who they are, believe them. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump yeah. is continuing to tell us, and with more rapidity, that he is an autocrat. And if he takes power again, he will be an autocrat. And this worshiping of Hitler's power just like this worshiping of President Xi, just like this worshiping of Kim Jong-un, just like this worshiping of Vladimir Putin, it all comes from the same disturbing place. He, he has an anti-American bent to authoritarianism. Absolutely. I mean, Donald Trump has told us like 57,000 times who he is. Uh, and we see clearly who he is. Uh, and what a sick, warped individual he happens to be. I mean, it is, it, it, it's hard to look at him any other way. Um, uh, yes, you always follow the money with Trump, but, but it's more than his lust for money. It's more than his narcissism. There is this authoritarian bet, this, this, this fawning over authoritarian figures. I know we're going to talk about it later, but Viktor Orban at Mar-a-Lago? Are you are you kidding me? This is the this is the great guy, the great leader that he wants to wants to praise. It's it's just sick, and it 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 amazes me, and I'm sure it amazes General Kelly, and it amazes a lot of a lot of other people that more Americans, that all Americans, don't see this in Donald Trump and don't don't fear it and reject it. Um, but again, here, here we are. He's, he's a, you know, going to be the Republican candidate, and uh, there's a possibility that he could be president again. Uh, it, it scares the willies out of uh, General Kelly, and it ought to scare the willies out of all of us. Yeah.
Former President Trump is expected to attend a hearing on Thursday in the federal criminal case involving his handling of classified documents at his Mar-a-Lago estate in Florida. U.S. District Judge Aileen Cannon will hear arguments on two of Trump's motions to dismiss his indictment, with his attorney set to argue the case should be thrown out because of the Presidential Records Act. Meanwhile, a former Mar-a-Lago employee is now publicly describing how he helped to move materials related to the classified documents case. Brian Butler says he was a Mar-a-Lago employee for 20 years and handled car service for the former president. Butler told CNN he helped Trump co-defendant Walt Nauta load several boxes onto Trump's plane at the West Palm Beach Airport on June 3rd of 2022. That was the same time the FBI was searching a storage area at Mar-a-Lago for classified documents. And did you have any idea at the time that there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. I mean, we were just taking them out of the Escalade, piling them up. I remember they were all stacked on top of each other, and then we're lifting them up to the pilots. How many boxes was it? You know, they asked me in, in the interview, and I, I believe it was I, 10 to 15 is what I remember. I know, they I know being it was, the investigators. Correct. And when you look back on that now, what do you... <laughs> well, I, I had no clue until um, probably the end of June. There was a few different things that happened that kind of opened my eyes to, you know, something's going on here. So you get that unusual request. Did you ever think to yourself, why were there so many boxes at Mar-a-Lago? For me, I'm just thinking, ah, oh, the former president, he has a lot of stuff he likes to lug around with him. I, I, I never would have thought it was anything like what we see now. Classified documents. Yeah, I mean. Butler's interview with CNN there. Butler, Walt Nauta's legal team, and the office of special counsel Jack Smith all declined to comment to NBC News. The Trump campaign did not immediately respond to a request for comment by NBC, although CNN reports a lawyer for Trump declined to comment. Join us now, former litigator and MSNBC legal correspondent Lisa Rubin. Lisa, good morning. Um, let's start with the, with the last part of that, which is Brian Butler mm -hmm. saying explicitly, I helped Walt not to load boxes onto a private plane to get them away from Mar-a-Lago right around the time the FBI was coming to search for classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. How does Mr. Butler play into all of this? Well, it's interesting because Mr. Butler shows up in the indictment with six different references across two paragraphs. None of those paragraphs relate to the incident that we were just watching as he described to CNN. Nothing about the indictment details how boxes got from Mar-a-Lago to Bedminster. It makes a passing reference to it. But the story that Brian Butler told to CNN is not currently part of mm. what Donald Trump has been charged with, what Walt Nauda has been charged with. So it's interesting to hear him provide this additional detail that isn't part of the case as we understand it. So why do you suspect he sat for that interview? Why did he want to go public and tell all these details? He got into his relationship with Donald Trump about how he doesn't trust Donald Trump, thinks he's a bad guy, et cetera, et cetera. What's he up to here? It's interesting. He worked there for 20 years. So on one hand, it's interesting to hear him say that he doesn't trust Trump now. On the other hand, I think part of his motivation is that he may believe that his name is about to be disclosed. Well, you might recall that Judge Cannon had ordered the unsealing of certain documents in this case that relate to almost two dozen witnesses or potential witnesses in the case. That order is under a motion for reconsideration. But if she decides that she's going to side with Donald Trump and his co-defendants, Brian Butler's name could become a matter of public record sooner than we think. It's always been an open question why the feds didn't search Bedminster as well. Uh, let's shift to the case here in New York. Yesterday, Trump's lawyers asked the judge to delay that trial, which is set to begin in just about two weeks' time, March 25th, until after the Supreme Court rules on presidential immunity. Um, what do we think? Is that, do they have a shot for that to happen? I really don't think that they do, John, and partially the reason that they don't is because they've waited so long to raise this argument. Judge Mershon, who is the judge overseeing the New York trial, issued an order last night taking a tweak at Donald Trump and his lawyers for putting this in at the very last minute. Jury selection begins two weeks from yesterday. Mm -hmm. They could have raised the question of presidential immunity at any other point during this case since the indictment. They hadn't raised it since last summer and then essentially let it lapse and didn't appeal a federal court's determination about that that relates to this case. They're now not claiming that he's immune from the case. They're claiming that the DA wants to use 
particular statements by him during his presidency that somehow should be considered official statements because he was president. The stuff he said about Michael Cohen, for example, on Twitter in 2017, 2018, is as personal as it gets. There's nothing official about it. I expect the DA to take a really hard whack at this motion when they respond later this week and for Judge Mershon to treat it similarly tough. So let's stay in New York, Lisa, and talk about E. Jean Carroll for a moment. Because, again, Donald Trump just had to post a $91 million bond, again defaming her at a rally over the weekend, again yesterday morning on CNBC defaming E. Jean Carroll, to which E. Jean Carroll's attorney, Robbie Kaplan, says, dude, I'm not quoting her, but... Dude, we can keep doing this if you want to, yep. and you'll keep writing us checks. Yep. Are they going to pursue another defamation case against Donald Trump? I wish I had a crystal ball <laughs> to answer that question. I certainly think they have grounds to do so if they would like to. But there are a couple of complications. One of them is proving that E. Jean Carroll has been further damaged by the repetition. Now this would be for the third time of the same lies that Donald Trump has been telling about her. And unfortunately, showing that she's been damaged in that way might perversely require Robbie Kaplan and her team to wait a little bit to see how the death threats mount, to see how the nasty and vile comments on Twitter pile up. To be able to show that she's been damaged is critical to filing a new suit against Trump, even if the larger goal is to punish him. The law requires some proportionality between her injuries and the punitive damages. And yesterday, Donald Trump calling her Miss Bergdorf Goodman, which is where uh, he was found liable of sexual assault against her uh, many years ago. Really quickly before we go, I just want to circle back to where we started, which is the documents case. Yep. Donald Trump's team is claiming presidential records act covers them and so that this should be dismissed we'll say it again for the 1000th time that is not what the presidential records act says that you can take classified documents home with you to your beach club does that hold any water at all that argument i don't think so i mean certainly it's an issue of first impression nobody has ever claimed before that the presidential records act somehow immunizes them from criminal prosecution you know that trump is like famous for a shorthand about this argument he always says the clinton socks case clinton socks case has to do with audio tapes that bill clinton made while he was president with the historian taylor branch the court found in that case that those audio tapes were akin to diaries which are exempt from the presidential records act it was not a determination that they were his personal records and therefore trump can analyze from that like hey these were all mine to begin with and I was president when I took them therefore there's no criminal liability here I think Donald Trump is again dreaming then again his audience is Aileen Cannon who when Donald Trump wants she usually provides so you're saying tapes yeah. of stories about your cat are different than taking war plans for attacking Iran back and waving them around your beach club Willie, that is indeed what I am okay. saying. Thank you for the clarification. <laughs> wow. Good to know. And wow, that's, BC uh, legal course. That's why we have her. She isn't she good? You're looking and you're going, how, how, how do you like be King Solomon and split that baby? She just did it. <laughs> <laughs> Stories Lisa, about you. cats. Okay. <laughs> Stories about nuclear weapons. Thank no. you. No. Okay. Right. We got mm -hmm. it now. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, Lisa. While serving as president in 2020, Donald Trump planned to ban the social media app TikTok from operating in the United States, and he was considering signing an order forcing China's ByteDance to sell the app over national security concerns. As far as TikTok is concerned, we're banning them from the United States, Trump told reporters aboard Air Force well, One. Well, that sounds strong. Yeah, very, he knows exactly, he's very, very concise there. Yeah, it's very, so he's against it. I yeah. mean, he's against TikTok. No TikTok. No commies uh, surveilling uh, the no United TikTok States. No TikTok for you. Yep, okay. Last month, Trump welcomed conservative hedge fund manager Jeff Yass to Mar-a-Lago. But doesn't he have a huge stake in TikTok? Yeah, $33 billion stake in oh, okay. the social media app. Okay. Over the weekend, one-time Trump advisor Steve Bannon suggested the former president was paid off by Yes, to switch his stance on the platform. Trump denied discussing TikTok with him. Yesterday, as legislation Whatever. that could ban lie. TikTok makes its way through Congress with Republican support, Trump was asked about the measure. Sure, if he still supports he it. Well, of course, right? Yeah. I could have banned TikTok. I had it banned just about. I could have gotten it done. Uh, but I said, you know what, but I'll leave it up to you. I didn't push them too hard because, you know, let them do their own research and development. And they decided not to do it. But as you know, I was at a, the point where I could have gotten it done if I wanted to. Uh, I sort of said, 
You guys decide. You make that decision because it's a tough decision to make. Frankly, there are a lot of people on TikTok that love it. There are a lot of young kids on TikTok who, who will go crazy without it. There are a lot of uh, users. There's you know a lot of good and there's a lot of bad with TikTok. But the thing I don't like is that without TikTok, you can make Facebook bigger. And I consider Facebook to be an enemy of the people, along with a lot of the media. Let's bring in right now former uh, Supreme Allied Commander of NATO, retired four-star Admiral James Trevitas. He's chief international analyst for NBC News, contributing writer for The Atlantic, Elliot Ackerman. He served five tours of duty in Iraq and Afghanistan, where he received the Silver Star, the Bronze Star for Valor and the Purple Heart. They are co-authors of a new book titled 2054, A Novel, which is the sequel to their bestseller, 2034, a novel of the next world war. We're going to get to that in a moment, but Admiral, first, let's talk about TikTok. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump, everything you said there uh, was a lie, uh, just in case uh, I, I could I could fact check him, but uh, just read the Wall Street Journal editorial yeah. page today. They fact check him uh, for me. But let me read just very quickly from this, just to talk about some of the real concerns why Donald Trump has flip-flopped, as Steve Bannon said, because a billionaire with a lot invested in TikTok uh, wants him to flip-flop. Uh, this is the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Not a left-wing rag, obviously. TikTok can't explain why posts that are divisive in America go viral, while those that are sensitive for the Communist Chinese Party get few views. TikTok's algorithms are still controlled by ByteDance engineers in China. Chinese law requires ByteDance to comply with Beijing's surveillance demands. This is why there is no way to mitigate TikTok security risks besides a forced investment. Mm. ByteDance employees once tried to uncover internal leakers by spying on American journalists. The Communist Chinese Party, through TikTok, spied on American journalists to try to uncover leaks. And they end by saying China's blocked U.S. social media companies that don't comply with their censorship regime. And the House bill would prevent Beijing from applying its political speech controls and surveillance in the U.S. Despite America's political divisions, this should be a shared goal. And it looks like it is a shared goal, except for Donald Trump, who uh, a billionaire walks through the gates of Mar-a-Lago and suddenly he's fine with the communist Chinese party surveilling Americans. Yeah. Do the words the swamp mean anything to you? Um, let's face it. TikTok. Wow. Is TikTok is universally across the political spectrum regarded as a national security threat, not just a concern, a threat. And I, on this one, I listened to a chairman of the bipartisan House Committee on China outgoing Congressman Mike Gallagher, combat Marine, a terrific thinker about China, and he is deeply worried and concerned about this, and we all ought to be. And final thought uh, to the novel 2054, it's all about how artificial intelligence can insert itself into these social networks. And here is a beaten path to the heart of America, TikTok, to our youth, we need to get control of it. It should not be connected to bike dance. Yeah. Just days after Donald Trump's allies took over the Republican National How's that Committee, going? Dozens of RNC officials have been pushed out of the organization. But at least they have a lot of money to spend on the campaigns, right? Two sources tell NBC News at least four senior staffers were terminated yesterday, oh, and as many as 60 officials could be laid off. Wow. According to Politico, the RNC's new chief operating officer sent a letter to employees explaining the new leadership team was, quote, in the process of evaluating the organization and staff to ensure the building is aligned with its vision. Its vision, of course, is pay Donald Trump's legal fees. Be in a cult. And be in a cult. As Politico notes, Not the in that order. shakeup underscores the swiftness in which Trump's team is moving to take over the Republican Party's operations after the former president all but clinched the GOP presidential nomination last week. I, I mean, heading into the 2024 election, Trump's campaign... They're facing a massive cash crunch, and yeah. some people are worried 
well, they should be, that he's spending way too much of his political money on legal bill, bills. Yeah. Now, they can't pay his civil liabilities, can they? I no, right? There's even concern he may not be able to afford to hold his signature rallies. Take a look at how MSNBC's Von Hilliard explained the situation. Not only are they looking at a deficit in finances compared to Biden, but also there is the reality here at play that $80 billion have already gone towards legal related expenses over the last two years from Trump affiliated super PACs. So they're already starting into a deficit. Add on to the uh, uh, add on to the reality here that the RNC is having to figure out how to best fund also Senate in down ballot races. There are serious question marks for the Trump uh, team and how they're going to be able to even compete. Here's also a reality at play. It takes manpower. Money can also help towards, this is my, my big shtick here, money can help towards actually putting folks on the ground in these states. In the areas where they are going to rely on to pull off victories are in rural parts of Georgia, rural parts of Wisconsin, rural parts of Michigan, rural parts of Arizona. And to get folks that normally don't vote, you got to go and tell them, we need you to come vote. And so Bullhead City, Arizona, if you don't have the money to finance some actual staff out in those areas, it makes it a lot more harder. And you can go and have a rally in those places, but those rallies cost $400,000. I mean, this is where you don't expect to see Donald Trump to be parading around the country because those events cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to put on. They're in a predicament now, whether they like to admit it or not. You know, uh, Willie, it's not like Nikki Haley and all of us and anybody uh, that has cared for a healthy Republican Party hasn't been warning about this for years, that if you elect Donald Trump, you elect a guy who's not fit to be president, first of all, but secondly, is going to put the Republican Party in a terrible, terrible position. He has looted his campaign funds to pay for legal bills. And now he's he's firing people inside the RNC and putting family members in there to pay even more of his legal bills. And he's doing this as he's starting to go into a general election, as Jonathan O'Meara said, you know, it's 50-50. I personally don't think it's 50-50, but you look at the polls right now, it's about 50-50. And Republicans have selected a candidate who's, who's gutted his campaign cash. By the way, this has a huge impact on people running for the Senate, people running for the House, Republicans who need help from the RNC. That's just not going to happen now. And because he's gutting uh, people in there who were competent, uh, most likely, uh, they're now going to have a bunch of, of, of cult members going in, personality cult members going in there, and the incompetence will grow by the day. Yeah, what happened yesterday was a purge. It was a loyalty test. So if Lara Trump, who is Donald Trump's daughter-in-law, she's now the... She's the co-head, but she's really running the RNC at the behest of Donald Trump is seeing who's loyal to Donald Trump and who's not. And if you're not sufficiently loyal, you're gone. So I think that's sort of yeah. the definition of a cult. And it's showing up in donors, Joe. We talked a couple of weeks ago about that Financial Times story that Donald Trump has thousands and thousands and thousands fewer donors than he had at this point when he first ran. And why? Because they're saying, I'm not giving you all my money to pay your legal bills. I'd like to see Republicans win. I'd like to see maybe even you win, but also senators and, and House members be reelected. But I'm not here to pay your legal bills. And that has a real impact, like you say. Let's bring into the conversation executive director of the Republican Accountability Project, Sarah Longwell. The group is out mm -hmm. with a new $50 million campaign to showcase Republican voters against Trump. Take a look. Trump talking about retribution. Retribution and going after people is disrespect of our military. The military people that he's disgraced. 91. 91. Criminal felonies. Four different indictments. He mishandled classified documents. Taking documents. Now his desire to do away with NATO. Donald Trump talks about abandoning Ukraine. He said he'll be a dictator on day one. If he's going to be a dictator on day one, he's going to be a dictator, period. That kind of stuff scares me. Absolutely scares me. The second Trump term would be worse than the first. I second term for Trump would be far more extreme. It is dangerous, outright dangerous. I cannot support Donald Trump again. I'd never vote for him again. You'll never get my vote, ever, ever. Again, those are all Republican voters. Sarah, good wow. morning. It's great to have you on. So what is your sense, because you've been doing these focus groups for so long now, getting the pulse of voters, what is your sense of how big that pool of Republican voters is, who's open 
maybe not to voting for Joe Biden, maybe, but just not showing up for Donald Trump at this point in 2024 in a way that maybe they did in 2016 and even 2020. Yeah, there's one number that keeps coming up over and over again when you think about what percentage of the Republican Party hasn't gone sort of full MAGA, and that's 30 <clears> percent. If you ask how many voters uh, believe that the election was stolen, you get about 70 percent of the Republican Party and about 30 percent don't. When you ask Republicans, uh, do you, if Donald Trump is convicted of a felony, will you vote for him? About 30 percent say no. Um, Nikki Haley was pulling about 30 percent, you know, 28, 27 percent mm. of self id Republicans in places like South Carolina, uh, in Michigan, in uh, New Hampshire. And so I think that that is our persuadable group of people. Now, some of those people are going to go home to Trump. There's no doubt about it. Um, they will just they're sort of always Republicans. Uh, but there is another group in that 30 percent that I think has already been voting for Joe Biden. I mean, we've now run this campaign, Republican voters against Trump in 2020. We ran it in specific places in 2022, like Republican voters against Carrie Lake. Um, and so this group has sort of been there for a while. But then there's this other group. And I would categorize them as kind of double doubters or double haters or a pox on both their housers. They tend to not like because they're sort of they're right leaning independents, they're soft GOP voters, they're not Democrats. And so they have a tough time voting for Democrats. But also, they don't think Donald Trump is a Republican, not like the kind of Republicans of Reagan or of John McCain or of Mitt Romney that they like. And so they've got a hard choice. And I think strategically, we think about this less like building a pro Joe Biden coalition, because a lot of these people, they don't they don't love Joe Biden. But what you can do is build an anti Trump coalition and get these people to either say, look, I cannot vote for this guy. I will not be part of him taking over the Republican Party and running mm -hmm. out everybody normal. And even if they can't quite like we want as many of them as possible to get there on Joe Biden, we want to help build that case. But most importantly, we want to make sure that there is a permission structure being created with real Republican messengers. And all of these people aren't just Republicans. They are Trump voters. They have voted for Trump at least once. And they are saying they will never do it again and explaining why. And these real people tend to be the most persuasive and credible with other uh, sort of persuadable voters. Sarah, you just used one of those sort of buzzy political phrases, permission structure, that has really gained a lot of credence in recent cycles. Tell us a little bit more about the, what that means, the idea of where you're telling a voter, hey, it's okay to go against what you've always done before, vote this way instead. Well, look, when we were trying to figure out how to beat Trump back in 2020, uh, we were running some of these ads that you see go going viral on Twitter where we were really beating up on Trump um, and they were catchy and they'd get, you know, millions of views, but they didn't persuade these sort of center right soft GOP voters. I mean, voters, they were kind of turned off by all the attacks on Trump. Uh, and so we started experimenting with these testimonial style videos of real people saying, Hey, I'm, I'm Tommy from Texas and I'm a Christian and I cannot vote for Donald Trump as a Christian. And that really connected with people. That's what people found persuasive because they wanted to be kind of on a tribe, right? They, they're used to being part of a Republican tribe. They don't feel part of a Democratic tribe. And so we had to kind of build them a new tribe where they felt like there was safety in numbers. They had a group mm. they could attach to. And being a Republican voter against Trump allows you to maintain that Republican identity for there are a lot of these voters. They, you know, that's really important to them, but still be against Trump and be with a, a group of people that, that feels the same way. And so that's the kind of permission structure you're creating. Sarah Longwell, thank you very much for coming on the show this morning. And in about an hour, former special counsel Robert Hur, who investigated Biden's handling of classified documents, will testify in front of the Republican-led House Judiciary Committee. And this morning, NBC News confirmed Hur will testify as a private citizen and not a Justice Department employee. NBC News Chief White House Correspondent Peter Alexander has more. This morning, after a year of public silence, special counsel Robert Hur will testify before Congress. Hur, a former U.S. attorney appointed by then-President Trump, has faced fierce backlash following his report about President Biden's handling of classified material.
saying he found evidence the president willfully retained documents, but not enough evidence to prove his case to a jury, citing, among other reasons, that President Biden would come across as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory, the president quickly doing damage control. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. Following his feisty State of the Union, President Biden is still trying to dispel voter concerns about his ability to serve a second term. I'm not a young guy. That's no secret. But here's the deal. I understand how to get things done for the American people. Mr. Trump seized on the report last month. Crooked Joe got off scot-free. Now, I don't know if you call it scot-free. They said he was a mental basket case. In fact, her did not say that. Still, House Republicans today are likely to accuse her of giving President Biden a pass and to press him for additional observations about what her called Joe Biden's diminished faculties. House Democrats are likely to zero in on her's conclusion that no criminal charges were warranted. And they'll also underscore her's distinction between President Biden, who cooperated with the investigation, and Mr. Trump, who prosecutors say repeatedly refused to return classified documents and obstructed the investigation into his conduct. He's now facing 40 criminal charges. Overnight, a key witness in Mr. Trump's indictment speaking out on CNN, describing moving those classified documents at Mar-a-Lago. They were the uh, boxes that were in the indictment, the white banker's boxes. That's what I remember loading. And did you have any idea at the time that there was potentially U.S. national security secrets in those boxes? No clue. No, I had no clue. NBC's Peter Alexander with that report. Let's bring in NBC News White House correspondent Mike Memoli, who has new reporting on the transcript of Biden's interview with her. And and Mike, tell us about that. And, and what more white might we expect to hear from him today as a citizen? What's the difference? Well, Mika, when you think back to last week, the State of the Union address, you saw just how overjoyed Democrats, even those Democrats in the room were, at the president's feisty, as Peter Alexander just described it, performance. But that that reaction was in part based on just how worried Democrats were a month earlier when the special counsel, Robert Hur, released that mm -hmm. damning report with his assessment that the president was an elderly man with a poor memory. Now, I had a chance yesterday to read all 260 pages of the transcript of that five-hour interview that took place over two days. And what you find when reading that is a much more nuanced picture of that series of back and forth with the special counsel and his team than was presented in the report, and that's been shorthanded mm -hmm. now. You see the president often asked very technical questions about how he consumed classified information, how he retained, whether he retained documents, where they were moved as he was leaving the vice presidency. Biden at times flashed anger at some of these questions that he thought went well beyond what anybody should be expected to recall. He often also flashed some humor in the very first page of this transcript, uh, the, the president is told by the special counsel that he's going to ask him about issues going back more than a decade. And Biden jokes, well, I'm a young man, so that shouldn't be a problem. He often also <laughs> takes some questions he's asked and goes into very vivid details about things that happened more than a decade ago. At one point, they're looking at a picture uh, that was found in Biden's possession of a trip he took in 2011 to Mongolia. I happened to be on that trip with then Vice President Biden uh, more than a decade ago, and he recalled things that I had to look up myself to sort of verify were the case. And so there are certainly uh, moments here in which, yes, the president does show that he struggled to remember certain things or at least had a difficult time recalling things. The most important one was one that NBC News first reported about. It was, in fact, the president who raised the timing of his son's death not special counsel Robert Hur. He was he brought that up in an important context as Hur was asking him to describe what documents he was using and how he was storing them in 2017 when he first left the vice presidency and was embarking in life as a private citizen for the first time. The president at the time says that it was uh, at around that time that his son Bo was diagnosed with cancer, something that had actually happened more than two years earlier. And so that has been wow. a, certainly a flashpoint on which uh, her based part of his assessment here. Uh, but when you read the full context, the president uses that question to launch into a much more detailed series of, of discussions about the series of events that led from him leaving, making the decision not to run for president in 2015 and ultimately doing so in 2020. So you saw a lot of detail that showed the president's memory was quite 
intact. Um, does the transcript undermine the assessment that the special prosecutor made um, in, in his assessment of the president, sort of, what, I don't know the words he used exactly, aging man with a poor memory or something, or does it even out somehow? Well, Mika, I think an interesting signal about how the politics may play out on Capitol Hill today comes from the fact that just in the last few moments, the Democrats on the House Judiciary Committee have now posted the full transcript. It was sent up to Capitol Hill this morning, and it was Democrats who first mm -hmm. posted that transcript this morning. I, I believe that they see what many in the White House who I've talked to about this see, which is that the fuller picture here does uh, help present the fact that the, the president was able to recall events with great specificity and, and talk about uh, a very complicated series of issues uh, over the course of a long period of time. Mika, you have spent some time with President Biden. You've talked to him. As I was reading this, I also re reflected on the fact that somebody who spent more than uh, 16 years at this point covering Biden as closely as anyone, the conversation ensued in a way that it often does when you have time uh, to spend with the president and he talks about these stories. And so uh, it, rather than talking about whether this undermines her, I think it certainly gives Democrats an opportunity to challenge her uh, about why and whether it was appropriate for him to make the kind of assessments in his report that he did. Interesting. NBC's Mike Memoli, thank you very much. Uh, to an update on the ongoing fallout with Boeing. We are learning this morning that a former employee turned whistleblower was found dead. His death comes as yet another Boeing plane was involved in a midair mishap. NBC senior correspondent Tom Costello has more. This morning, police in Charleston, South Carolina, tell NBC News they are aware of the death of a former Boeing employee turned whistleblower. 62-year-old John Barnett found dead on Friday from what the coroner calls an apparent self-inflicted gunshot wound. So this is my uh, retirement plaque. Barnett retired from Boeing in 2017 after working as a quality manager for more than 30 years. Since his departure, he has taken legal action against the company, claiming he was retaliated against for raising safety issues internally, issues that Boeing denied at the time. Back in 2019, Barnett sat down with Today describing a haphazard safety culture at Boeing. From day one, it's just all been about schedule and hurry up and just get it done, push the planes out, we're behind schedule. You know, we don't have time to, to worry about issues that y'all bring up. In 2017, the FAA released a review upholding many of Barnett's concerns. With regards to his sudden death, the company released a statement writing, We are saddened by Mr. Barnett's passing, and our thoughts are with his family and friends. Production standards at Boeing are under intense scrutiny, following a series of troubling incidents involving Boeing planes. The latest on Monday, when a 787 from the South American airline Lantum apparently dropped abruptly mid-flight from Sydney to Auckland, injuring at least 50 passengers and crew members. The airline says it's unclear what caused the strong movement on the flight. NBC News has also confirmed the Justice Department has launched a criminal investigation into Boeing following the blowout door plug on a 787 MAX 9 in January. The NTSB determined the plane left the Boeing plant without critical bolts that hold the plug in place. A scathing new FAA audit also found Boeing failed to comply with its own quality control procedures. We're working with Boeing and uh, demanding that they come up with a very detailed plan within the next 90 days uh, to fix the quality issues that are out there. NBC's Tom Costello with that report.